Sorry about the hat, I need to protect my eyes from the bright sun. In the first video of this series, I looked at a cult called Buddha Field, where the obvious impression, the attraction of it, was a sense of joy, fun, childlike pleasure. This next cult is very different. It's a British cult where the impression was of awe. Now the first one, Buddha Field, was a sort of one's classic idea of a cult because it began with um, a mysterious person arriving, claiming powers. And um, when I say mysterious, you know, quite a lot of speculation about where he came from and everything. But the point is that he had reinvented himself, changed his name, invented a past, and then turned up as a spiritual leader. And that, for many people, is oh, how a cult must always begin. But this next cult is something very different. Now I'll say how I became aware of it. Um, when I was at school, um, before I entered the sixth form, um, I was in the top class. And I was nearly always top of the top class, but there was another person who was often top of the top class too. And um, we were sort of rivals, but we didn't really know each other very well. Um, and uh, when it came to specialising for A-levels, we went our different paths. I became a mathematician, and I think he went into some humanities course. So we didn't uh, really um, keep in touch at all. And then when I left school, um, I remember one evening, there was a, a BBC sort of news magazine programme. I think it was probably Panorama. And they introduced um, an interesting new therapy group in London called Compulsions Analysis, I think it was. And there was this friend of mine, Hugh Mountain, well, the person I knew, Hugh Mountain, um, in the group. And he was taking part in a sort of interrogation session where two people faced each other at a table and um, they had an e-meter, which was um, uh, a sort of skin resistance meter. I've, I've got one of a rather primitive sort. And um, what it is is it tells you, uh, it's, it's the same principle as a lie detector. It shows you your emotional state if you put a sensitive question. And they were facing each other and sort of deeply insulting each other. I don't just mean sort of Yahoo fart face, but you know, basically you are an insecure person because you, there's nothing to you. And the other person would say, thank you. Um, and they were using this e-meter to sort of uh, control their reactions um, or get a feel for their reactions to these questions. I thought that was very interesting because I recognised there was something there from Scientology that I'd heard about. Um, now, that was all until some time later when I was in the streets of London, there were people selling this wonderful magazine called The Process. And um, the people were very striking because they had sort of long black capes. Um, uh, this was the time of hippies, um, you know, most people were sort of wearing tie-dye and covered with beads and that sort of thing and flowing and all that. These had a sort of severe, interesting look about them. Um, and um, not a mass of beads, thing, but just simple sort of um, pendant around their neck, silver against the black. Um, they're very striking. And the magazine was the same. It was dramatic. It was awesome. And um, I'll just show you some idea. Remember, this is the this is the hippie era when um, design is very flowing and sort of pretty with flowers and things like that. And then you get a magazine with a cover like that, sort of powerful, awesome looking. And um, there's some better pictures here of the type of artwork that they had, which was really striking in in that hippie time. Um, Look at that. Wow. Powerful. So, um, there I was feeling very impressed 
and I bought all their um, magazines. Um, I had an almost complete collection. Now, I wish I had them to show to you, but um, I gave them to uh, Genesis, um, who was founding the Topi in, in the 80s, and um, Temple of Psychic Youth, because he was very interested, and I'll come back to that later. Um, but he gave me sort of photocopies of them, which I haven't managed to find. So, um, Anyway, so there was this awesome people on the streets of London, and um, uh, I used whenever I went to London, I'd try to get hold of copies. Now you might say, why didn't I immediately join? Well, the trouble is, one trouble is I'm not really much of a joiner, but I was attracted to this. Um, it, it sounded such an interesting group, and um, but the other thing is, the main thing was that uh, I was a sort of poor scholarship kid from the country and this was obviously very much a rich um, city people's uh, organization it um, they based themselves in a large house in the poshest part of London just about Mayfair Balfour place and um, uh, coming from Scientology they adopted the thing of you know expensive training sessions you know, so like three guineas for 55 minutes, which doesn't sound a lot now, but um, as you had to buy them in sets of six, that means forking out 18 guineas. And that was at a time when um, a Mont Blanc Meisterstück pen, which now costs, I don't know, 350 pounds or something like that, uh, cost about 11 pounds. You know, so <laughs> money was very different then. So anyway, this seemed just impossibly expensive, and, but I'd buy their magazines and anything I could find from them. Um, why? What was so good about that design? And I discovered later that the founding members had been architecture students, and that really made sense to me because they had the sort of free-flowing thing of, of um, psychedelic art, but add to that the discipline that is needed for architecture. You know, you can build fancy things, but they have to stand up, they have to be engineered correctly and everything. So there's that sort of combination of discipline and free flowing, which made them very attractive and rather very awe-inspiring. Now, I just wish I had pictures of what they looked like on the street with their long black capes and this simple sort of um, uh, thing around their neck. Long black capes were not unheard of in those days, you know, uh, I had one. It was an ex-post office cape. And they're wonderful things for sort of, um, for uh, free festivals and that, because you don't have to take a sleeping bag. You wrap the woolen cape around you and you've got an instant bed. So they're excellent uh, items of clothing. Um, but anyway, I didn't sign up, not much of a joiner. And, um, but I was so attractive that when they opened a cafe in Balfour Place, and it became quite a centre apparently for sort of you know um, well-known people there and artistic people. This was swinging London, and um, uh, the, the guy who founded the Tibetan monastery in the north of England um, after the uh, Chinese invasion, um, he was there apparently meeting people, and. Uh, I was very keen, so next time I was up in London, which wasn't that often, I went to Balfour Place and I found it all locked up. <laughs> so next time I found a, 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 a street seller, um, I said, I went to Balfour Place and it was all locked. And she said, that was in your reality. <laughs> I thought that was such a great answer. <laughs> Remember that forevermore, my reality. So. Um, how does this cult form? Well, it, it didn't begin, say, with one person turning up and saying, I am the master of that. It began with two people who met doing Scientology. And they really liked the methods of Scientology. You know, this, this use of these e-meters um, to uh, get to the depths of people's emotions, to see when they felt emotional about something. You see, the sort of thing is that um, you hold the electrodes and it measures your skin resistance like a, a lie detector. So if um, at the beginning of a session I say something like, you're a very quiet person, 
um, and they get a bit of a flicker, you think, mm, that's a sensitive thing. Um, so sort of in the next session or later on, you might get to saying, you're, are you such a quiet person because you're ashamed of yourself? And then the meter sort of, you know. Um, and then you might eventually get round to saying, you're a quiet person because you're so guilty about the way you treated your baby brother when you were jealous of him or something. And you, know, and you found a deep, deep secret about it. So um, these people got a few friends together and were doing these sort of um, sessions. But it wasn't yet, you know, the master doing it to the juniors because um, they were doing it to each other. And becoming a very close group, uh, you, you know, when you know so much about the other person, you've talked to such depth, such emotional depth with other people, it brings you very close. And this was the beginning of um, what one of the people who wrote about them, um, called William Sims Bainbridge, in a book called Satan's Power, uh, what he calls the implosion. Because if you imagine this, um, young people, late teens and twenties, uh, in many ways you're quite superficial because you're sort of trying to make build an image in the world, you know. So you go to the um, to the college bar and you know talk about girls and football and that sort of thing. And um, the most intense things you talk about is when you have an intellectual discussion. You know, I remember um, the English people in the English department. Someone would say, "There's no such thing as a, as an American novel," and then a great sort of debate would go on for the rest of the evening. But it's not really uh, touching on deep emotional issues. So when you have been in a group like the, uh, the process and you come into back into ordinary life, it all seems very superficial. Um, you know, as one of the things that someone said was, um, uh, uh, whatever the process is objective val validity, we were doing something. We weren't just staying home and watching TV. And um, another thing which is not so obvious in the Buddha field, they were sort of physically having a great time and, and being wildly alive. Now these people was much more reserved, but someone said these people were alive like no other people I'd met. They were alive in a sort of um, awareness sense. And that was pretty impressive. So, uh, as I say, this implosion, the group becomes so intense that anything outside seems superficial. As someone put it, the sense that we were all of one mind, that we ceased to be individual consciousness but had fused in a way we didn't understand. Um, it says people veer from participating in a psychotherapeutic system to become a group of spiritual zealots. How could this happen? We surely didn't start off that way. Many of us were trying to break free of the religious belief systems we'd grown up with. Getting involved in another one was the last thing we wanted. Yet our intense belief was coming on us slowly and incrementally. They were becoming a very tight-knit group and not only were they beginning to despise the world outside, which got the name the Grey Forces, um, but also uh, the world outside was beginning to be very suspicious of them with their sinister black cloaks, things like that. They were being cast out and so they left the country and went looking for um, their spiritual home. And in Mexico, to cut a long story short, they found this place called Shtul. I think that's how you pronounce it. But it's, what's, the way it's written is X-T-U-L, which again really fits that awe thing. But wow, what a, to English readers, what a weird word. Extal, what's that mean? You know, They found this place and um, they uh, lived in sort of abject poverty there, just living off the land. And had really weird sort of psychic experiences. 
This is one of the things that happens with this intense um, working together. Uh, not only do you find out the deepest secrets of each other, but you begin to get things like past life experiences. And I've had this myself. Um, and uh, so, uh, although they rejected the, um, the two founders rejected the sort of sci-fi stuff of Scientology, these methods were very powerful and they were producing very interesting results. And while they were installed, um, the, the leader, well, the person who was becoming the leader, I should explain, the two people who began this were, um, these were the two people who were in the Scientology cult and started the cult. And um, uh, he was Robert de G. Moore, and she was Mary A. McLean. Now, um, they were just, he was actually a sort of, a fairly shy and um, curious intellectual person. And she was rather more mysterious because she had, she'd come from uh, Glasgow, um, from a really rough life. And she'd even been a call girl at one stage. Um, but the thing is that she was a very powerful character. And she set up um, Robert Moore um, in a number of ways. Firstly, uh, his middle name, De G, was De Grimstone. So she changed his name to Robert De Grimstone, which immediately sounded much more impressive and sort of uh, um, aristocratic. And she got him to do up his image like that, looking really sort of Jesus-like. Um, now, there is that picture of her, but it's the only picture that's around because she then retreated to be the power behind the throne. And I really mean power, because um, at one point she even claimed she was nothing to do with it. But she was sort of using him as a mouthpiece and building him up as the sage, the saviour. And it was true, when they were in Stull, he, began, he proved his worth by coming up with these scriptural um, messages and, and writing these scriptural pieces, which... Uh, sounded very impressive. Uh, so when they came back to London, they were the core of a very definite cult. So what were the, um, what were they preaching? Well, you see this model here, Lucifer, Jehovah, Satan, the game of the gods, and outside is the grey forces. In, in some of their magazines, they showed this idea that there are three great um, beings, they called them at first, gods, but uh, Jehovah, Lucifer, Satan. Now, two of those, of course, are considered by the outside world to be demons, and so this looked like a very evil, satanic message they were passing. But what they were actually trying to say was that these are three ways of approaching the world. And I'd like to say a bit more about that at the end. So either you were a person who was disciplined, rock solid, a Jehovah person, or you were an easygoing, um, open to anything person that was Luciferian, or else you were someone who was very much aware of the dark side of human nature, and that was the Satan. And basically, was the idea that you could approach God um, in these different spirits and it's you're doing what was true to your own nature. Now that I, that was very appealing to me because you know I always liked the um, uh, the pagan thing of you know God even if you think that basically it's all one God but it has many faces you know you could worship in a Venusian way in a um, jovial way in a martial way, you could choose, and it, you're not sort of stuck in being in one. And sure enough, in their system, um, it soon became more sophisticated. You could be, you had a main face, but you also had a, a secondary nature. So you could be a um, Luciferian, very free and easy on that sort of thing, but uh, you had a strong sense of your dark side, and so you had a sort of an inner Satanist, as it were. 
But so that really was um, uh, not quite the sinister thing that the outside world saw it as that got them driven out of Britain. The other part of theirs was um, a sense as of, instead of that trinity, there was a sense of duality, which Robert of Grimson expressed it like this. He said, Jesus said, love thy enemy. Well, who was the enemy of Jesus? It was Satan. So Jesus needed to love Satan. And if you see Satan as the enemy, you must learn to love him. So you can see that's a, a very radical idea, and it has a certain appeal to it. Um, yeah, so by now it was becoming a cult because those two um, grand figureheads, as they began to shape themselves, well, as she was going into the background, but this was the figurehead, um, though she was the one who was really directing the thing. Um, they became the Omega, and they lived at the top floor of this splendid house. Um, and the other people just shacked up in the rest of the building, you know, sleeping on the floor and things like that, living a very simple life, while they were churning out this magazine and selling it on the streets and making enough money to pay for this expensive building and the luxury life that the Omega were living in the top floor. And this is where it becomes exploited because it's forming a hierarchy. They went out to recruit other people who weren't in that initial group and they had to earn their way into that initial group by doing things like giving all their possessions to the organization, working entirely for the organization. And that was really, they were making them into slaves. Slaves except that they were having an amazing experience in the group. That was the payment and that what drew them into it. If I um, find some of the things they said about it. Whatever the process objective reality, we were doing something. We weren't just staying home watching TV. Uh, I've already said that one, yeah. Um, just about the three gods. The three gods represent three basic human patterns of reality. Within the framework of each pattern, there are countless variations of permutations, widely varying grades of suppression and intensity. Yet each one represents a fundamental problem, a deep-rooted driving force, a pressure of instincts and desires, terrors and revulsions. All three of them exist to some extent in every one of us. Each of us leans more heavily towards one or the other. And some of their sayings. Basically, we are not human beings. We are universal beings, free souls journeying through time. We have chosen to be human as part of our journey. We have taken on the limitations of a human existence, therefore become subject to its laws. We have chosen for a period to limit the extent of our choice. So let us be quite clear of everything that happens to us on some level or other, our choice, our decision, and therefore our responsibility. So he was preaching rather like Crowley, you know, finding your true will, the sense of inner responsibility um, and yet, the two people, um, the Omega at the top, were living luxury while everyone else served them. They were getting um, into trouble in England and people were writing nasty um, uh, sort of exposés of them in, in the, in the uh, Yellow Pages press. And um, there was a lawsuit which they, they lost. And um, so they went around the world visiting Rome and you know all sorts of capitals finding places to set up chapters so and they had some success with that they, they, you know it began to become a worldwide organization in particular they went to America um, and at some point uh, I think in America they realized they could register with a charity so they changed their name to the process church of the final judgment um, and it became very uh, what's the word sort of um, end times cataclysmic and um, uh, they began preaching that we're facing the end of the world which was not such a stupid thing to be saying in the 60s and 70s because of the cold war and the, um, uh, the risk of nuclear 
annihilation. I should just say that it sounds very quaint looking back, but you see, the 60s was a time of great expectations of things new. The hippie movement was something new, it was revolutionary, very exciting. But by the time you got to 68, 69, 70, it was no longer headline grabbing. It was a thing we got, began to get used to, like the psychedelic art. And then this came in as looking like the new thing, dramatic, awesome, powerful. And so, um, you know, it had enormous appeal. But to the outside world, it was just too weird. All this sort of Satan stuff and the long... I wish I had pictures of these people in their long black capes because they're really worth trying. It's a thing that, um, you see, if you... If you dress differently, you're a bit of a weirdo. But if a whole group of people dress differently and sort of move with a certain amount in unison, the effect is very powerful. If you think of the various Netflix films we've seen recently where people wore masks, um, the money heist, where they all wore Salvador Dali masks. Wasn't that dramatic? Weird. And various other ones where people, you know, um, uh, I think in, um, might have been in uh, Line of Duty, where robbers all appeared with the same mask, or when all bank robbers appeared with the same mask. And it's a very powerful effect when these sort of people come in in uniform. And that's what these people, the impact they had on the street was really quite amazing. But, of course, it terrified some people. And so they got associated, um, people began to associate them with Manson murders and um, being Satanists, and they got exposed left, right and centre. And what they did was, um, well, by then the two top people at the top were beginning to split and Robert de Grimston wanted to sort of revive the old spirit of the process. But the powerful one, Marianne, um, she changed it to something else called the foundation um, and Christianized it. Now you see, I was brought in, I was interested in those three deities that they talked about because I, I saw it as a powerful sort of psychological tool. But when you introduce a fourth one, they introduced Christ initially as the um, mediator, um, but then it became a fourfold scheme, and uh, it lost all its sort of dynamism. And I'd like to talk a bit about that later. It lost its dynamism, and um, it became it sort of faded out. They changed from black uniforms to grey uniforms, which is ironical because it's all the things they said about the grey forces. And um, then it sort of fizzled out. They did the awesome thing. They, they loved it. We said, um, we love to be mysterious, to have people gossip about us, and to appear different from the world. It was good theatrics, milked for every extraordinary impulse outsiders offered. Did we simply create a huge fantasy, a big thought form, or egregore, and a concept of the divine that was just a concept? Or did we actually, at least for a time, tune into an eternal truth that went above and beyond our own mythos. We enjoy the attention, too. We played it up in our magazines, poking fun at our detractors, once again using their rejection as po further proof of our rightness. What we didn't know, of course, was all this posturing would blow back on us so harshly a couple of years later when we were in America. So you see, there's that sort of... Um, the temptation of enjoying being different and special and that sort of thing and feeling you're the chosen ones against the fact you're beginning to make enemies. And um, they say they tried to resolve it later on by becoming a friendly, um, charitable organisation. But it never had the same effect as that original process. <coughs> Concluding words of one of the people, which I thought was very good, looking back at it, he said, um, some of us talked about having been fooled, taken for a ride by an extremely clever con artist, but had to admit it had been the ride of our lives. 
With self-imposed gullibility, we swallowed utter garbage under the rubric of such nostrums as, I'm sure it's valid at some level. That's rather like, you know, the, uh, the, the building being shut in my reality. And the final words of, um, there's an excellent book called, I think it's sort of Love, Fear, Sex, Death or something about it, um, which you can get on Kindle. We got a great deal wrong in the process, which is what made it such a rich vehicle of learning. Yet, for all that, we were on the right track. Behind all the flamboyance and apocalyptic ranting, disguised perhaps by that very extravagance, we were learning to quieten ourselves and listen. For that, I will always be grateful, says Timothy Wiley in 2009. Now, what does one learn that, that a cult isn't always someone coming in from outside, pulling a fast one by inventing a guru personality and imposing it on a group of people until they start believing it. This one sort of formed from people coming very close to each other, turning away from the world and um, becoming so close that they sort of became a sect which then grew into a cult and then in came this problem of the hierarchical structure that two of them sort of hid themselves away and just made these pronouncements um, and were living a life of luxury while all the others were serving them and there were the inner ones who'd been to Stoll um, formed an inner core who were like the aristocrats in this system. And then there were the people who came in um, to be street workers, selling things and raising money and all that to feed into this hierarchy. And then there were the people who just wanted to come in to talk or to have therapy sessions or whatever, um, all bringing in money, feeding in. But it was, we felt that it was a real such an honor to if you could become part of the inner in, in a group that you would sacrifice anything to do that you'd give up all your possessions um, there wasn't this emphasis so much on on celibacy um, which there was in the buddha field and there wasn't um uh there wasn't this thing of buggery um, but uh at times because it was the end of the swing 60s they did experiment with enforced orgies and things like that but it was never quite the same sort of core of the thing it's just a thing that happened and of course again made them unpopular with the outside world I said that I'd given my magazines to Genesis of Topi because he was very, became very interested in this in the 80s and he, he got inspiration from the process um, and he that was part of what he did when he was building his Temple of Psychic Youth. He took some of their ideas um, and had the good sense to avoid some of their mistakes. On the question of sacrifice, Topi, which is a very, um, on the face of it, is a very sort of uh, open and um, you could say a Luciferian movement, but, but Genesis said, transformation can only occur if the individual is prepared to sacrifice all they have, including a previous personality. A displacement of a status quo, smashing old loops and habitual patterns is essential. So he asked the people in his group to adopt different names, to adopt different things. I don't think there was quite the same sort of money grasping thing but they too had to raise money and do things um, for, the, for the movement but he was never living in the sort of exploitive luxury that the process leaders were he goes on to say we wanted to develop a system of practices that would finally enable us to consciously change our behavior which the process did erase our negative loops and become unencumbered with psychological baggage the process too, certainly at its inception, seemed to me to have a similar high ideals. Where the two experiments diverge is the incipient hierarchy that ultimately seems to have disintegrated the process, while Topi 
struggled so hard to avoid having a leader or an omega, despite the surprising tenacious appetite for Topi participants to create a leader, a guru figure, who was then resented for not having all the answers. My rejection of the pressure to become an omega veghead caused a splintering. See, this is very interesting that um, it's easy to say, oh, these people forced themselves on the, um, on the lower people. Um, they pretended to be leaders and, and got the others under their thumb. Whereas what um, Genesis found is actually in a group there becomes a huge pressure to have a leader. Um, they keep sort of putting you in that position. You are the master. Even though he didn't want that and he knew that was where it was going to be dangerous. And um, the downside, of course, of being this master is you have the responsibility for anything that goes wrong. And he wasn't sure he wanted that. He wanted people to be responsible for themselves. As the Processians had said, you know, everyone is responsible for themselves. And yet they created a, a culture of irresponsibility. And um, Genesis goes on saying, Topi was built almost as an anti-cult. Over and over in both Timothy Wiley's and Edward Mason's texts, this is books that have appeared about the process, they stress the autocratic, matriarchal, and expectation of strict obedience imposed upon the processians by the Omega. There's no question that a totalitarian system can facilitate maintaining an unorthodox organization. There were times we coveted such monolithic techniques. They would have liked to have done it themselves at times, just to hold it together. But in the end, Topi persevered with as democratic a system as possible. And I'd say Topi is much more successful because it had many thousands of members around the world, and um, it never quite, well, as with anything, they got into trouble with the law and this, that, and the other, and they were driven out of countries. But they never quite got the sort of um, fear and hatred that uh, the Processians got. Um, I'd like to look back at um, sort of things that I found attractive about their theology and their ideas. Satan, Lucifer, and um, Jehovah. As I say, outsiders can think that they're devil worshippers. But for me, that is an example of a Trinitarian system that I wrote about in The Good, the Bad, the Funny, where I said that if you think in twos, you always end up with opposition, a fight, us and them. If you think in fours, earth, air, fire, water, you tend to end up with a freezing into a stereotypical things. You know, are you an earth type? Are you an air type? Um, you, you, you stereotype people. But if you think in threes, it isn't so easy to do that because three is a movement, a process. Now, I know the three faces of the goddess, you know, maiden, mother, crone, some people try to stereotype that and, oh, she's a mother type, she's a maiden type. But actually, it's about a process, the waxing and waning of the moon. Um, and I think it's best considered that, ah, ooh, um, beginning, maintaining, ending. And I think it's best if you think in terms of astrology, earth, air, fire, water, it's very easy to st uh, classify people you know, um, under types. But if you think of cardinal fixed mutable, mutable, it isn't so easy. Because cardinal is the initiating, the revolutionary, the shatterer, the iconoclast. Mut fixed is the maintainer, sustainer. And then mutable is the becoming something else, or be, um, you know, being prepared to change. And I saw their three in those terms. You see, Satan is their recognition of the dark side of a person, which is really what is needed 
to be cardinal. If you think of the movements, um, Hitler's movement, for all his high ideals about improving Germany and all that, what really drove it was rage, his anger. Um, if you think of the revolutionary, it's usually anger. Um, if it's, um, think of companies that were formed, very often it's greed or wanting to make a name for yourself, pride. Very often it's these sort of things which actually set things going. And the, you say the plus side of this satanic idea is a recognition that we have this in us. If I think of, um, I don't know, sort of going back to about the 80, 1980, you could say that um, Microsoft was founded on greed because they wanted to become, you know, the PC on every one on every desktop. Whereas um, Apple, you could say, was founded on arrogance. We have the best system in the world. We're going to revolutionise it. And um, in a way, that was what happened to Apple. They had this breakthrough idea and all that. And then the sustaining bit, the Jehovah bit, where they had to just keep the company going. And they got rid of um, some of the most creative people like Steve Jobs because they had to bring in the money people and the organizers and the management that sort of thing. And it became a fairly ordinary second best to um, Microsoft computer company. Of course, it had its fans and that, but you know, it wasn't a big thing in the world. And till it became a bit sort of tame and they were doing st producing stupid things like the Newton and then they realized they had to re have a rebirth and they brought back Steve Jobs they brought back the arrogance and changed the world and they'd be successful um, so this sort of um, cardinal fixed mutable thing um, I saw that reflected in their um, in their three gods and it's interesting that the idea of Jesus, love thy enemy, um, which is a dualistic thing, uh, went along at the same time. And they became very apocalyptic. You know, they said the world is ending, this, that, and the other, which of course is another great thing to have the cult. So all these things um, were all fed into this cult, but it wasn't something that began with a person coming in and saying, I'm going to exploit people was a group of people who came together to change the world and in that very positive nexus came a hierarchy and real exploitation. It just evolved in it and that says something about um, the nature of cults. Try to think of someone who you might think is the absolute opposite of a cult. And many people would say, um, now I think I'm going to give that example later. Yeah. Now, in the next one, I want to talk about actually making a cult, how one might go about it. So I think that's enough for now.